Muslims, like Christians and Jews, consider themselves spiritual descendants of Abraham. 1.5 billion people in this world are Muslims. 250 million of them are Arabs, and over 1.2 billion are non-Arabs. There are Chinese Muslims, European Muslims, American Muslims, Latino Muslims. One out of every five people in this world is a Muslim, which is enough reason to learn about Islam. It is important to realize that Islam is not just a religion, but it is a complete comprehensive way of life. It's not something that we only do on Fridays, but it carries over into our workplace, our families, our communities, and our friends. Linguistically, in the Arabic language, the word Islam comes from the root word Salama. And from this root, you can have three different words with three different meanings. The first one is submission, the second one is purity, and the third one is peace. Submission, purity, and peace. Surprisingly, the word Islam Islamically carries those three meanings. The word Islam Islamically means that if any person fully submits himself or herself to the will of God, and worships God purely without any association with God, worships God alone. He or she should live in peace and harmony in this life and in the hereafter. So the word Muslim in the Arabic language doesn't mean literally a follower of Prophet Muhammad. The word Muslim literally means someone who submits to the will of God and worships God alone. Na, na, na. Muslims feel they are in harmony with the universe because the Quran mentioned several times that everything around them is submitting to the law of God and worshiping Him, while they are also worshiping and submitting to God. Do you not see that Allah is the one who is praised by all those who are in the heavens and in the earth? The very birds praise Him as they wing their flight. Each one knows its prayers and how to praise him, and Allah has full knowledge of all their actions. The Quran stresses on the point of living in a worshiping universe, wherein every single being worships God in its own way, which may not be comprehended by man. The Quran says, the seven heavens the earth and all beings therein declare his glory. There is not a single thing that glorifies him with his praise, but you do not comprehend their hymns of his glory. These verses become very inspiring for me when I hear the birds twittering early morning or at sunset. I say, oh my God, can this be their two prescribed times of prayer? Or when I go to the lake and I see the duck swimming in a V shape like that, I say, can this be a congregation prayer that they do? And this duck in the front, can it be the Imam duck? I look at the creation like musicians in a concert. Each one is playing one instrument, but at the end, all of them are contributing to the same tune. The universe is in harmony. One of the really, really amazing things about Islam, and what caused me as a young man in North America to accept it as a way of life, is not only does Islam encourage us to accept the existence of our Creator, but also it pushes us to look into His creation at the variance in colors and languages and cultures and respect the power of this divine force through His creation. One of the most basic facts in Islam and most important beliefs is that there is a creator and one of the ways of recognizing his existence and mightiness is by studying creation the creator said to those who believe and those who do not believe in the Quran in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alternation of the night and the day there are signs for people 
of understanding. After deep thinking, many ancient and modern philosophers reached the fact of the existence of a supreme being who created this universe and is maintaining it continuously. Aristotle, an ancient Greek philosopher and student of Plato, tried to demonstrate this fact saying, we hold then that the God is a living being, eternal, most good, and therefore life and a continuous eternal existence belong to the God, for that is what the God is. If people look around them, they will see the intelligent design everywhere and in their own selves. Take the eye as an example. The light reflects on the object and then reflects on our eye retina where it is transferred into pulses to a place in the brain called the center of vision. And it is probably one of the darkest places in the human body because it is completely insulated from light. It never saw the light. And all the images that we view in our lives are formed in this part of the body, the center of vision. We see all these bright, sharp, three-dimensional images in this part of the body. While thousands and thousands of engineers in TV factories are trying to come up with an image as sharp, bright and clear, but still they cannot. And if someone claimed that TVs that we have at home just came by chance, atoms accumulated and made those TVs, no one will believe it. But still, some people believe that the vision system came by chance. Same applies for hearing, taste, the way kidneys work, the way livers work, etc., etc. The Creator said in the Qur'an, Were they created without a Creator? Or were they their own Creators? René Descartes, a noted French philosopher, and one of the most influential thinkers of modern times was led to belief in God through doubt. He doubted that there is God, but doubt meant to him that he thinks, which in turn meant that he exists, which therefore meant that he was created, and since he did not create himself, therefore someone else must have created him, and that one should be the source of life. Can I be the author of my being? Or can I conserve myself at the present time? If this would be the case, then the idea of a perfect substance would be caused by my own mind. In order for this to be, I should have to be God himself. As this, I am clearly not. Infinity is before finitude. Immanuel Kant one of the most influential thinkers of modern times, who is regarded as the last major philosopher of the Age of Enlightenment, was impressed by all the variations, numerations, and synchronizations in this world that make the existence of an omnipotent supreme being a fact. This present world presents to us so immeasurable a stage of variety, order, fitness, and beauty. Whether we follow it up in the infinity of space or in its unlimited division, that even with the little knowledge which our poor understanding has been able to gather, all language with regard to so many inconceivable wonders loses its vigor, all the numbers their power of measuring, and all our thoughts their necessary determinations, so that our judgment of the whole is lost in a speechless but all the more eloquent astonishment and in another message which encourages people to reflect upon the signs of the Creator in the universe and in themselves the Creator says we will show them our signs in the universe and in their own selves until it becomes manifest to them that this is the truth bring 12 marbles number them from 1 to 12 and then put them in a bag shake the bag and close your eyes and pull out marble number one and then pull them all out one by one do you know what is the chance of doing that you need to try about 479 million times to pull them all out 
in order. So if putting 12 marbles in order is that impossible, what do you think the chances of having this entire universe come by chance with all its systems, with all the precision, the, the synchronizations, the variations, the infinite numerations? People think that this can come by chance. Fred Hoyle, a famous English mathematician, expressed the impossibility of formation of higher life forms without a creator. The chance that higher life forms might have emerged by chance is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from materials therein. Every evolutionist attempt in the 20th century to account for the origin of life have ended in failure. Jeffrey Bada, a professor of geochemistry and a leading advocate of the theory of evolution, confesses this fact in the February 1998 issue of Earth, one of the leading periodicals of evolutionist literature. Today, as we leave the 20th century, we still face the biggest problem that we had when we entered the 20th century. How did life originate on Earth? After lengthy studies and several experiments, the famous French biologist, Louis Pasteur, refuted the foundation that lays ground for the theory of evolution. Can matter organize itself? No. Today, there is no circumstance known under which one could affirm that microscopic beings have come into the world without parents resembling themselves. Muslims believe that every human being is born clean and pure, ready to submit by nature, which means no one will come on the day of judgment and say, O oh God, you cannot punish me because you are the one who created me bad by nature. One of the wonderful things about Islam is that we do not believe that human beings were born into some type of original sin or curse. We believe, in fact, that the creator of all, God Almighty, has written on the hard drive of every human being the ability to know him, to draw closer to him, and to worship and serve him. Thus, instead of original sin, we as Muslims believe in original goodness. Muslims believe that people are born without any inherited sin. Although we believe that we are from Adam, and Adam is from Earth, we also believe that if someone has committed a sin or a crime, he should carry the sin on his own shoulder on the Day of Judgment not on the shoulder of his sons, or his grandsons, or his great-great-grandsons. Muslims believe that faith is an action of the heart, and that no one can force anyone to change his faith. The Quran addresses this in chapter 2. Let there be no compulsion in religion. The reason why this verse was revealed to Prophet Muhammad is that before Islam there were some ignorant people who hated to have newborn baby girls and some wanted their boys to live. So they made oaths to God that if they were granted boys, they would make them Jews. So there happened to be that there were a generation of idolaters whose sons were Jewish. Some of those parents became Muslims and then they started to put pressure on the Jewish youth to convert them from Judaism to Islam. The Jewish youth were defended in the Quran with this verse, let there be no compulsion in religion, leave them alone. Why force anyone to become Muslim? No one can force anyone to become Muslim simply because Islam is an action of the heart.
Muslims believe that there is no supremacy based on color, race, or sex. God says in the Quran, Surely the most honored of you in the sight of God are the most righteous of you. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that all people in the sight of God are as equal as the teeth of a comb. There is no privilege for an Arab over a non-Arab, nor for a white over a black, except according to their level of piety and righteousness. So it is piety and righteousness, not racism. This means that Muslims believe that God Almighty never chose the Arabs to be the chosen people, or the Jews, or any people because of their race. Muslims believe in six main beliefs. Almighty God, Allah, the angels of God, the scriptures of God, the messengers of God, the day of resurrection, the divine destiny. Muslims believe that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. And this shouldn't be offensive for anybody, simply because the word Allah is an Arabic word that means the one true God. The word God is not an accurate translation for the word Allah, because you can have derivatives from the word God. There's a goddess, false gods, Roman gods, Greek gods, true God, Godfather. But the word Allah means the one true God. Arab Christians and Jews worship Allah as well. In the very first page of the Arabic Christian Bible, the human eye reads the word Allah six times in the first paragraph of Genesis alone, 17 times in the whole page, and hundreds of times all through the Bible. There is no God except Allah. Muslims believe in the absolute uniqueness and awesome nature of our Creator. That means that He is not like His creation in His attributes, in His actions, or His essence. For if the Creator was like creation, He would not be worthy of worship. But in Islam, we believe that God, Allah, is absolutely unique and far removed from any likeness of His creation. For that reason, we do not draw pictures of Him or try to depict Him. We also believe that Allah, God Almighty, is the Creator of all. He's so merciful. He provides for everything that exists, from the birds in the heavens, to the fish in the streams, to young children who play in the streets. He's so merciful that he even provides for those who deny his very existence, like Karl Marx, for example. Could you imagine at the end of the month if Karl Marx received a bill for his oxygen that said, look, Karl, if you don't pay this bill, we're cutting you off. But no, Allah, God Almighty, is so merciful that even those who deny him are recipients of his magnificent and awesome mercy. Muslims believe that Allah is unique. There is nothing like unto Him. He is the creator of man and the creator of animals, so He does not look like any man, nor any animal, nor any plant. He is truly beyond imagination. Actually, Allah has so many names and attributes that describe Him like the merciful, the forgiving. But why do Muslims use more frequently the word Allah more than any other word? It's because you can have a merciful son and a forgiving wife. But when a Muslim wants to communicate with another person and he wants him to understand that he needs God, then he needs to say Allah, the one and only God. 
the All-Merciful, the Beneficent, the Savior, the Knower of all, the Hearer of all, and the Seer of all, the Judge and the Just, the All-Aware, the Magnificent, the Forgiver, the Highest, the Greatest, the Preserver, the Mighty, the Generous One, the Watchful One, the responder to prayer, the perfectly wise, the loving one, the majestic one, the resurrector, the truth, the possessor of all strength, the ever living one, and the self existing one, the all powerful, the supreme one, the patient one, and the guide to repentance. What is the purpose of life? Is it to enjoy the pleasures of this world? To eat and drink and reproduce? The purpose of life is one of the most fundamental questions, but still most people are unable to answer. If we meet someone in a hotel and ask him, what is the purpose of your existence in this hotel? He should give us an answer. He may say, well, I am here because I have a booking or I came to meet some people who are staying in this hotel or I came to eat in a restaurant. But if he says, huh, I don't know what I'm doing here, then this person is probably lost and he needs guidance. But if we ask ourselves, what are we doing here on planet Earth? Those who don't know the answer those who do not know the purpose of their life need guidance. Allah said in the Quran, I have not created the jinn and humankind except that they should worship me. If we think about all the gifts given to us, our eyes, how can we thank the Creator for the gift of vision? our ears. How can we thank him for the gift of hearing? Did we ever think about our kidneys and the hundreds of simultaneous chemical operations that happen in them to purify our bodies from fatal toxins? Did we ever think about our brains and the amount of information that it is acquiring and retrieving in no time? Did we ever think about our hearts that keep on beating non-stop for a lifetime. Add to them the gifts of having children and wealth and so many more bounties. The Quran challenges man to count the bounties of Allah which are infinite and uncountable. And he gives you of all that you ask him and if you count Allah's favors you will not be able to number them. Surely man is very unjust very ungrateful. Allah is the one worthy of all thanks, all praise, and all worship. The purpose of life is to submit and be in a continuous state of worship. Some people may think, come on, give me a break. How can I worship continuously? I need some time to sleep. I need some time to eat. I need some time to work and make some money. And explaining this leads us to talk about the concept of worship in Islam because it's different from the concept of worship in any other religion. In any religion, to worship is to pray, fast. These are called rituals, a very small part of the worship in Islam. In Islam, to worship is to do anything that is lawful with good intentions. Which means that sleeping can be considered worship in Islam if it's done with good intentions. And this is crystal clear in the Quran when Allah described those who pray voluntarily and stand the night in adoration. He said they used to sleep but little in the night. But actually, we pray when we are awake. I could have understood it like that. They used to stay awake for a long time at night. But no, Allah didn't say so. Allah said it like that they used to sleep but little in the night because like that the verse is mentioning the two types of worship praying voluntarily which is understood from the meaning and sleeping with an intention 
to wake up early and pray, so their sleeping were considered a worship. Another very amazing saying for Prophet Muhammad is what he said to the companions. He said that one of you gets rewarded as if he is spending in charity when he is practicing sexual relationship with his wife. And they said, what? Can one of us be rewarded for fulfilling his desire with his wife? He said, why are you surprised? Don't you think that when he does it unlawfully, which means by cheating on his spouse, he can be punished for that? They said, sure. He said, why are you surprised then that if he does it lawfully to please his wife and please himself, fulfill their own desires and stay away from illegal relationships, this can be also rewardable by Allah. And this means that any lawful action can be a worship in Islam if it's done with good intentions. This means that the purpose of life in Islam is always to do the good work with good intentions, which means to be always in a continuous state of self-development. Muslims believe in the existence of angels. Angels are created from light. They will not be held accountable as they do not have free choice. Each angel is assigned to do a specific task. Some of them record our deeds and some of them protect human beings. The Archangel Gabriel is responsible for carrying the messages of God to the messengers. Muslims believe in all the books of Allah, like the scriptures of Abraham, the Psalms of David, the Torah that was given to Moses, the Gospel or the Injil that was given to Jesus Christ, and the Quran which was given to Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon them all. The Quran stressed on this belief and mentioned the Torah as a source of guidance and light. Surely we did send down the Torah to Moses. Therein was guidance and light by which the prophets who submitted themselves to Allah's will judged the Jews. The gospel was mentioned also in the Quran as a source of guidance and light. We sent Jesus, son of Mary, confirming the Torah that had come before him, and we gave him the gospel in which was guidance and light and confirmation of the Torah. Muslims believe that the Archangel Gabriel carried the books of God 100% correct to the messengers of God. وَقَالَ مُوسَىٰ يَا قَوْمِ إِن كُنْتُمْ آمَنْتُمْ بِاللَّهِ فَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلُوا فَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلُوا Muslims believe in the original scriptures, the purely divine books that have been revealed to the messengers of Allah in its original text. But when man starts translating them, then a human contribution is added to them, which is not divine. So the translations cannot be considered divine. Which means that if a person told you, let me give you an English Quran, correct him, tell him there is nothing as so-called English Quran say an English translation for the Qur'an. The Qur'an is only the Arabic text. And of course, this applies for all other scriptures. The original scripture is the one in its original text without translation. So translations cannot be considered divine. The Qur'an is the last revelation of God and the principal source for every Muslim's faith and practice. It deals with all subjects that concern human beings including wisdom, doctrine, worship, and law. There are two basic themes for the Quran. The first theme is the relationship between Allah, the creator of this world, and his creation. And the second theme is the relationship between people. The Quran provides guidelines for a just society, proper human conduct, 
and equitable economic principles. In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the compassionate, the merciful, King of the day of judgment. You alone we worship and to you alone we turn for help. Guide us on the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, not of those who have incurred your anger, nor of those who have gone astray. Amen. For so many years, I used to ask myself when I saw people fighting each other, Oh Allah, why did you create us from different backgrounds? Men and women, whites and blacks, and people are fighting each other. Wasn't it a better idea that you could have created us all from the same background, coming from the same sex, speaking one language, same color, instead of people fighting each other? And then I found the answer to my question in the Quran, because in the Quran you can find an answer to any question that you have in your mind about the creation. I found it in a verse that has become a very dear verse to my heart. O mankind, we created you from a male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other. This verse was the answer to my question. Because diversity is a blessing. It's a blessing that we are different. Imagine that the people in this world could have been all from the same background, speaking the same language, eating the same food, looking all the same. This life could have been so boring, no chance to get to know each other or discover each other. And of course, some businesses could have gone out of business like tourism because travel where, see what? It's a boring world but it's a blessing that we are different. Diversity is a blessing that people are abusing by attacking the homes and lands of each other. One of the remarkable things about Islam is the unique relationship between science and religion. Unlike other philosophies, we believe what bonds and holds religion and science together is stronger than what pulls them apart. It is through the knowledge of science that we are unable to unravel the mysteries of the divine, draw closer to him, and garner a respect for his awesome power day in and day out. Those people who have been blessed with knowledge are given high ranks in our faith because of their ability to interpret and explain to us the reality and the awesome nature of God Almighty, Allah. The closest advisor to Salahuddin, the Muslim leader who defeated the Crusaders in Palestine, was a Jewish scientist, Maimonides, one of the most famous Jewish scientists in Jewish history. Galileo was tried for having resumed the discoveries made by Copernicus on the rotation of the earth. And he was condemned as a result of a mistaken interpretation of the Bible, since not a single scripture could reasonably be brought against him. I believe that if Galileo was to live in a Muslim country at that time, he would never have been persecuted or ended up in jail. Many Muslim scholars are considered to be the greatest scientists of their time. And some branches of science are considered to be either an Islamic innovation or indebted to Muslim scholars. Jabir ibn Hayyan, known in Latin as Geber, is recognized as the father of chemistry. Chemistry in Old English is alchemy, which came from the Arabic word for chemistry, alchemia. Al-Khawarizmi, known in Latin as algorithm, invented algebra and was very instrumental in calculus 
and in the development of trigonometry and the use of algorithms. Ibn Sina, known in Latin as Avicenna, for 500 years his two books, The Canon of Medicine and The Book of Healing, were the authority on medicine. Al-Zarawi, known in Latin as Albocasis, is recognized as the father of modern surgery. He invented 200 tools of surgery and many of them are still in use until today. In Islam, seeking knowledge is something greatly praised. If you look carefully at the Quran, you'll find a large number of supplications, but only one supplication is ordering us to ask and beseech our Creator for an increase in something, and that is knowledge. The Quran, God's Word says, and say, O oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Thus in Islam, if somebody, whether male or female, sets out to seek knowledge for an ethical purpose, to benefit humanity, to make life easier for others, they will be greatly rewarded by their Creator. After examining the Holy Scriptures in the light of modern science, Dr. Maurice Bukai, a famous French scientist, mentioned the following statement in his book, The Bible, the Quran, and Science. I could not find a single error in the Quran. I had to stop and ask myself, if a man was the author of the Quran, how could he have written facts in the seventh century that today are shown to be in keeping with modern scientific knowledge? Allah God Almighty said in the Quran, it is he who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon. They swim along, each in an orbit. The orbital movement of the two celestial bodies is confirmed by the data of modern science. And it is inconceivable that a man living in the 7th century AD, however knowledgeable he might have been in his day, could have imagined them. Almighty Allah said 1400 years ago about mountains. Have we not made the earth as a wide expanse and the mountains as stakes? The famous geologist Sir George Airy discovered that what we see on top of the earth, perceiving them as mountains, are just the tops of the mountains while most of their masses are embedded underground, exactly like a stake that is used to anchor a tent in the ground. He said, mountains are merely the tops of great masses of rock floating in a denser substratum as icebergs float in water. Allah said about his ability to return us back to life perfectly on the day of resurrection yes we are able to fashion in perfect order the very tips of his fingers 1400 years ago some people wondered why God chose to mention the fingertips instead of mentioning something more complicated like the kidney or the eye today science proved that this part of the body is one of the most complicated parts because it is carrying a unique fingerprint. Allah said in the Quran, whoever Allah guides, he opens his heart for Islam, and whoever he lets go astray, he makes his chest constrain as if he is ascending gradually in the sky. 14 centuries ago, who could have known that as a man ascends gradually in the sky, Oxygen decreases, leading to the feeling of chest tightness. These must be the words of the Creator, Allah. <laughs> Muslims believe in all the messengers of Allah as human beings who were chosen to educate people, warn them, and give them glad tidings. As for those who believe that there is only one God, and there's only one humankind because there's no difference between us. Men are not better than women, whites are not better than the blacks. 
why would you think that God would send different messages? To confuse us? Of course not. And it was always one message sent by God to the humankind, and that was always the message. Worship God alone and do not associate any partners with him. Definitely, this is what Noah said, what Abraham said, what John the Baptist said, what Jesus, what Moses, and what Muhammad, peace be upon them all, said. There is none worthy of worship except the Creator Himself. And it was never religions. It was always one religion. Not the religion of Muhammad alone, not the religion of Jesus alone, not the religion of Moses alone or Abraham, but rather the religion of Allah that was carried once by Jesus and once by Moses and once by Muhammad. And this means that by, by becoming Muslim, one joins Muhammad in his religion, Jesus in his religion, Moses in his religion. As Muslims, we believe that all of the messengers of Allah were the most noble of people to walk the face of the planet Earth. They committed no major errors nor sins, and that was because they were chose by the divine Allah, God Almighty. They delivered his message in a perfect way, and maybe somebody will ask how, and will remind them that the one who chose them is the all-perfect, the omnipotent, the master of all, the Lord of everything, God Almighty, and when he chooses something, he chooses it with absolute wisdom and knowledge. Thus he chose these people to be those who would deliver and be the forebearers of his message, his light which was sent to humanity. Muslims believe that messengers are not divine, which means that none of them is the son of God. Islam respects and dignifies Jesus Christ. The Qur'an confirms that he was born miraculously without a father and through the same power which had brought Eve to life and Adam into being without a father or a mother. Truly the likeness of Jesus with God is as the likeness of Adam. He created him of dust and then said to him, Be, and he was. Muslims hold Mary the mother of Jesus in high acclaim. The Qur'an bears witness to her lofty status by saying, And remember when the angel said to Mary, O Mary, indeed Allah has exalted you and purified you and chosen you above all of the women of the world. Jesus, the son of Mary, is one of the most important messengers in Islamic tradition. He represents one of the five great messengers recognized by the Qur'an. He suffered great persecution and was maligned by many, but his message has endured and the light of his message continues to shine till this day. Allah emphasized in the Qur'an the importance of believing in all the prophets and all the scriptures as a condition of faith. Say, we believe in Allah and the revelation given to us, and that given to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between one and another of them, and we submit to Allah in Islam. Prophet Muhammad is not the founder of Islam, like some people claim. Prophet Muhammad is just the final messenger of Islam, a colleague of Jesus and Moses, a graduate of the same school from which they graduated the school of God. The traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, represent to Muslims what is commonly known as the Sunnah. The Sunnah or traditions of the Prophet represent the second source of legislation in our Islamic tradition. It is important to know that the Prophet Muhammad did not come out of a vacuum, but he was loved and adored by his people prior to becoming a Prophet. In fact, they used to call him Al-Amin, which means the trustworthy. After he brought his message, many of those same people turned against him. 
But the reason for this was that his message was a sincere message. It was not about buying or winning over friends, but about changing hearts and minds and redirecting the focus of human being from the worship of false idols to the worship of the Creator, from the oppression of the poor to justice and equality in society. His message was a powerful message that shook the hearts and minds of his friends and neighbors. Most of those who possessed power and wealth opposed him. And there was a struggle for 23 years between believers and idolaters, truth and falsehood, good and evil. And they tried to stop him with all means. They tortured him and his followers. They even killed some of them and they negotiated with him. They said, what do you need? Do you need money? We will give you wealth. Do you need women? We will marry you from the most beautiful women. And we can make you a king if you want to be a king. But he refused. And he said, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand to quit, I won't stop till the message is conveyed or I die conveying it. He is the most beautiful example for all people because he was not just a prophet. He was also a father, a husband, a teacher, a politician, a negotiator and a warrior. He was a reformer to be able to convince Jews, Muslims, pagans 14 centuries ago to sit together and sign one pact saying that if our city is ever under attack from outside, we will all side by side defend our city. That was a revolution at that time because at that time loyalty was only for the tribe. But he was able to convince them to transcend their tribal differences and start thinking for the first time as a civilized society. One of the most important things that we take from the Prophet's teachings and his message is hope. This hope still shines in the hearts of millions of Muslims the world over. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said something that always has shaken me and always caused me to find the will to have a hope in my Creator. He said that if the day of judgment was to start and you had a tree, a small tree in your hand, plant that tree. Before Prophet Muhammad, society downgraded women. They were personal belongings of men and even considered objects of inheritance. Prophet Muhammad condemned this abuse of women. He gave them the right to inherit, to divorce, to gain an education, and to keep their identity and public life. He said, none of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. Beautiful words, but that's not easy. This means that if I'm applying for a job and a brother is applying for the same job and he got it, I should feel happy for him exactly as if I am the one who got that job. He said, if you see something wrong, then change it with your hand. If you're not able to, then speak against it. If you're not able to speak against it, then dislike that thing in your heart, for indeed, that is the lowest level of faith. The Prophet Muhammad said, the powerful is not he who knocks the other down. Indeed, the powerful is he who controls himself in a fit of anger, simply because many crimes are committed when people are angry. One of the most beautiful statements of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and one which really moved me prior to becoming Muslim and even after I've been a Muslim for some time, is the statement of the Prophet which says, indeed, God Almighty does not look at your shapes and sizes, but He looks at your hearts and your actions. This very simple statement has a huge, 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 huge impact on the way of life of all Muslims. Because our life as Muslims is based on two important qualities, sincere hearts and righteous actions. Thus, for example, if somebody was to give charity with an evil intention, they would not be rewarded. And if somebody was to have a good intention, and not follow that with a righteous action, that would also be not rewarded. 
But Islam is asking us to balance our life between a spiritual reality and a physical reality. And thus, through this statement of the Prophet Muhammad, we become complete, comprehensive, balanced, beneficial human beings. Many international intellectuals were impressed with Prophet Muhammad's personal qualities and expressed it in their writings. Lamartine, the famous French historian, in his book, The History of the Turks, said about Prophet Muhammad, If greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and outstanding results are the three criteria of human genius, who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad. Mahatma Gandhi, the spiritual leader of the Indian independence movement and the pioneer of resistance through mass civil disobedience, said about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I became more than convinced that it was not the sword that won a place for Islam in those days in the scheme of life. It was the rigid simplicity, the utter self-effacement of the Prophet, the scrupulous regard for pledges, his intense devotion to his friends and followers, his intrepidity, his fearlessness, his absolute trust in God and in his own mission. Wolfgang Goethe, one of the key figures of German literature and one of the most famous European poets who was also a painter, humanist, scientist and philosopher said about Prophet Muhammad. He is a prophet and not a poet and therefore his Quran is to be seen as a divine law and not as a book of a human being made for education or entertainment. Michael Hart, the American author of the wide-selling book, The One Hundred, a ranking of the most influential persons in history, chose Prophet Muhammad to be at the top of the list. He said, My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others. But he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular levels. It is this unparalleled combination of secular and religious influence which I feel entitles Muhammad to be considered the most influential single figure in human history. Muslims believe that human beings have free choice. Allah Almighty showed us the right path and the wrong path, and then left us to choose freely without any influence on our choices, and that one day life on earth will end, and on the day of resurrection, which is the beginning of the eternal life in the hereafter, all people will be resurrected, the good and the bad, the humble and the arrogant, the oppressed and the oppressors. Good doers among the believers will be hosted in paradise, whereas bad doers will be driven to hell. Everyone will be held accountable for what he did on earth. No one will be able to escape from the trial. And the Quran depicts the fear and the panic of people who will be worried about their accounts as follows. On that day, each man shall flee from his brother and his mother and his father and his wife and his children. Every man that day will have concern enough to make him heedless of others. God Almighty has provided human beings two important choices or roads. I want you to visualize with me now. The first road is a road of bliss. It's decorated, it's beautiful, it's comfortable, but in reality, it is a road toward your destruction. 
It is the road of obeying your soul, lacking discipline, and staying away from the call of your Creator. The second road, although its incline is initially steep, and the decorations on the road are not many, is truly the road of bliss. It's the road of sacrifice, going against one's carnal desires, not listening to one's lower self, submitting oneself to the call of the Creator. The Qur'an attests to this by saying, Indeed, we have shown man the two ways. Either he will be thankful or he'll reject. On the Day of Judgment, we'll be judged according to our choice. Which road did we follow? Those who are haughty and arrogant, those who are slaves of their own souls, will find themselves in purgatory. Those who went against their carnal desires were awake in the deep, deep slumber of this life obeying their Creator, staying away from evil and vice, submitting themselves, being just and merciful to others, they will find that the end of that road is bliss and paradise. Muslims believe that nothing happens without the knowledge of Allah and that by His knowledge He prescribed everything that's happening. He knows what happened, what is happening, and what will happen in the future. It is definitely a very important belief because a Muslim that practices belief in the divine destiny never gets depressed. He may get angry or sad but never depressed because sometimes what seems good is not really good, and what seems bad is not really bad. Let me give you an example. Sometimes something good happens, and we're so excited and so happy, and after some time, we may discover that that's one of the worst things that ever happened to us in our life. And sometimes something bad happens, and we're so frustrated and so angry, and after some time, we may discover that that's one of the best things that ever happened to us in our life. So, if we don't really know what's really good and what's really bad, why are we still exaggerating in our feelings of happiness or our feelings of sadness? To believe in the divine destiny means that you exchange those two feelings of happiness and sadness with the feeling of acceptance. Anything that happens, I accept. If a good thing happened, I accept. If a bad thing happened, I accept. And it may happen that you hate a thing which is good for you. And it may happen that you love a thing which is bad for you. Allah knows and you know not. The five pillars of Islam represent the foundation of every Muslim's life. Can you imagine a building without its pillars? Thus, try to imagine the life of a Muslim without these important pillars. These pillars join together to make a comprehensive, wholesome, holistic human being who has a strong spiritual edge, but at the same time is active and responsible in the daily sphere of our everyday lives. Without these pillars, the Muslim's belief is weak. It is not enough to say that I believe in God, or I believe in Allah, without following through with some type of important action. These five pillars represent those actions, those manifestations of my faith in my Creator. Shahada, or the testimony of faith. Salah, or establishing the prayer. Zakah, or paying the alms. Saum or fasting the month of Ramadan, Hajj, or pilgrimage to Mecca. Everything in life has a key, and the key to entering Islam is the declaration of faith. Perhaps you're thinking to enter Islam, you have to do something very difficult or, or perform some type of crazy or insane act. But the only thing that one needs to do to take this key 
and open the door of Islam is say a very simple declaration. Listen carefully as I say it. I bear witness that there's nothing in existence worthy of worship but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the servant and the messenger of Allah. If somebody says this with sincerity, they will become a Muslim. And that means this statement that I no longer live a life according to how I want, but I declare, just like when I get married, I declare my fidelity and my absolute honor and respect towards my spouse. When I become a Muslim, I declare my loyalty and my obedience to the Creator. I acknowledge that I will no longer submit to myself, no longer submit to the evil around me, and I will do so by following the method taught to me by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Some people may wonder, if Muslims really believe in all the messengers of God, why are they only mentioning Muhammad in their declaration of faith? Well, as Muslims believe in the oneness of God and in the unity of humankind, because there's no privilege for men over women or for whites over blacks, they also believe in the unity of the concept of prophethood. Muslims do not pick or choose. They believe in all the prophets. And the acknowledgement of the last prophet is an acknowledgement for all those who came before him. So the declaration of faith during the time of Abraham was like that. There is no God except Allah. Abraham is a messenger of Allah during Moses. Moses is a messenger of Allah during Jesus Christ. I bear witness there is no God except Allah. Jesus Christ is the messenger of Allah. And now Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. The acknowledgement of the last prophet is an acknowledgement for all those who came before him. Whoever says this testimony with sincerity is to be considered a Muslim. And whoever dies on this belief will enter paradise if his sins were forgiven. Becoming a Muslim does not give one a visa to paradise. The faith of Islam carries with it important responsibilities. This faith is represented by three important components. Number one, a sincere, sincere belief in the heart. Number two, the profession of this faith. And number three, following up this heart and this profession with sincere and virtuous actions. These important components of Iman or faith is what makes a Muslim balanced and comprehensive in his outlook toward the world around him. It gives him a spiritual foundation, but at the same time encourages him to be a force of positivity in his community. When people reflect upon the inner meaning of the testimony, they shall find liberation therein. It will break their chains. To believe that there is no God except Allah means that I will worship none but Allah. I will fear none but Allah. I will hope none but Allah. I will ask none but Allah. I will complain to none but Allah. I will love none but Allah and what Allah loves. I will dislike none but what Allah dislikes. He will be the core of my faith. It means that I will be no more the slave of any human or any material or any desire. People are caught up in the flow of daily life. They move away from subjects to which they should actually turn their attention. They forget the true purpose of life. The daily prayers open communication channels with Allah and eradicate their heedlessness. Prayer ensures that the believer constantly turns to his Lord and establishes a powerful spiritual bond with God. It is revealed in the Quran that prayer reminds people of Allah and keeps them from all forms of evil. Recite that which has been revealed to you of the book and keep up prayer. Surely prayer keeps one away from indecency and evil. And certainly the remembrance of Allah is the most important thing and Allah knows what you do. When someone accepts Islam, I often tell them, guess what? The race is not over, but the race has just started. When someone accepts Islam, it doesn't mean that they can take a vacation and run to Disneyland. No, there are certain, certain obligations which they must fulfill. And from those obligations is the important act of prayer. 
Everyone in the world knows that Muslims pray. And many people think that Muslims face the East. But if you see Muslims in China, they face the West. All of us face Mecca to observe these five important daily prayers. The Quran illustrates the importance of these prayers by showing that God Almighty has given the angels two wings and three wings and four wings. And for the human being who wants to soar to the obedience of Allah, just like these angels, God has given them two circuits of prayers, three circuits of prayers, and four circuits of prayer in a day. So just like the angels, our spiritual wings are found through observing this important, important act and mechanism known as Salah. Muslims turn their faces towards Mecca when they pray, where a black cubicle building exists, which is called the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the first house of worship ever built on earth. It was built by Adam and then rebuilt by Abraham and his son Ishmael. The Kaaba is not an idol that Muslims worship. Muslims believe that the Kaaba cannot do any benefit or any harm to anyone. The Kaaba is a center that unites Muslims around it in circles in the worship. And those circles keep on widening, widening, widening all over the earth. So when I pray individually, I still say, you alone we worship and to you alone we turn for help. I don't say I worship or I turn for help, even though I am praying individually. And this is simply because I am not alone. I am in a circle. Other brothers and sisters are praying with me on that circle, maybe in China or in Denmark, maybe on a boat or on a mountain. But the Kaaba gives me the sense of universality of this religion by uniting Muslims around it in worship in circles. Many people ask, and I've been asked this before, why do you guys put your face on the ground? What are you doing? What is this prostration? You know, this prostration or sujood in the Arabic language is not something new. If you look, for example, in the Christian New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 39, you'll find Jesus described there as prostrating and beseeching his Lord for his bounties. In the Old Testament, we find the great prophets, such as Abraham, and Moses and David, peace be upon all of them, described as prostrating and beseeching their Lord. What this shows us is that Islam is not a new message. Islam is not the invention of Muhammad, peace be upon him. But Islam is the message of all of the prophets. And the prophecy of Muhammad is the commonization of that prophetic message. It represents the zenith of the prophetic message to humanity. Now, what I would like you to do is try to imagine a way that you would show your submission to God. What would you do? What act would you, would you exhibit if you wanted to show your submission to God? Is there any greater act than the act of prostration? I challenge you to prostrate to your Creator. Malcolm X, a famous convert to Islam said, the most difficult thing he had to do when he became a Muslim was to destroy the arrogance in his soul and prostrate to his Lord. And he said the reason that it was difficult was not because of his arrogance, but he knew that once he prostrated to his Lord and he tasted the sweetness of that prostration and submission, he would never prostrate to anything else again. And he, Jesus, went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. The Bible, Matthew 26, 39. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. A Muslim is supposed to pay a financial obligation called zakah. All Muslims should spend 2.5% of their cash savings that were unused for a whole year on the poor, the needy, the homeless, and the orphans. 
In the early ages, zakah played a major role in freeing slaves. Muslims used it to buy slaves and free them on the spot. Five to 10% of any agricultural income. 5% is the percentage applied on those who have irrigation systems. 10% is the percentage applied on those who have no irrigation systems, but they depend on rain because they don't have much costs coming out of their pockets. 20% of any extracted resources or minerals, like petroleum, which means that governments, before they go buy arms and weapons for their armies, according to this ritual, they should spend at least 20% of their resources on the poor, the needy, the hungry people, and the homeless. And guess what? This is not a charity. Zakat is the right of the poor on the rich. Muslims do spend in charity, which what they spend in addition to the zakah. One of the traditions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is spend with your right hand what your left hand doesn't know, which means without showing off, do it with sincerity. Muslims fast the month of Ramadan, which is the ninth month in the lunar calendar. In Ramadan, Muslims do not eat, drink, nor engage in any sexual activity from dawn till sunset. At dawn, one controls himself from approaching the lawful, eating, drinking, or any sexual activity with his wife. At sunset, he can practice any of that again. And this happens 30 times. At dawn, one controls himself. By sunset, he can practice any of that again. And next day, control. Practice, control, practice. Do you see what I'm doing? Looks like a workout. After 30 days, one becomes behind the wheel, driving this body, not his body driving him. He becomes in control of his stomach and his sexual organs. Fasting is a ritual of worship that enhances your patience and perseverance through the discipline. Allah said in the Quran about fasting, O you who believe, Fasting has been prescribed on you as it was prescribed on those before you that you might guard yourselves. Hajj or pilgrimage is an obligation once in a lifetime only on those who are financially and physically able. It shows the universality of this religion. Last year, I did pilgrimage with 2.5 million Muslims. We were all moving together from one place to the other, eating together, worshipping together, praying together, and wearing the same simple clothes together. Anyone besides you can be a millionaire, an owner of a chain of restaurants in his country, or a very poor person. Nobody knows, simply because we are all the same. Hajj has changed the lives of so many people, like Malcolm X, who struggled for the rights of blacks in the United States and suffered from discrimination and racism, which in turn led him to have a negative perception of white people. After performing Hajj, he changed. He wrote a letter to his loyal assistants in his newly formed Muslim mosque in Harlem, asking them to duplicate it and distribute it to the press. He wrote, in pilgrimage, during the past 11 days here in the Muslim world, I have eaten from the same plate and drank from the same glass with fellow Muslims whose skin is the whitest of white their eyes are the bluest of blue, their hair is the blondest of blonde, and in their actions, and in their words, and in their deeds, I felt the same sincerity of the black people of Nigeria, Sudan, and Ghana. Peace, justice, and security can be attained only when man knows the purpose of his creation. That purpose 
is to turn to one's Creator, to turn to the one and only God, Allah. Thank you.